is you can extend it. So what kind of data can you define with XML? What kind of data can you specify? XML is a format for, for, uh, for, for holding data. Let's put it that way. It's a format for holding data. What kind of data can we put into it? Well, we can put in any data that we can think of. That's the extensible part of it. In other words, XML is not a format for a particular kind of data. XML can actually be implemented to create little mini, la mini languages, little languages. So XML itself is not really a language. XML is more like a meta language. That is, it's a language that allows you to define other languages. All right? That isn't confusing enough for you. What's an example of, X, uh, of XML? One example is MML. That's where those, those big guys get in the cage and they beat the heck. No, that one, that's MMA. I'm sorry, my bad. Uh, MML is math markup language. So in other words, to, to record mathematical expressions, there is MML. So MML is a language that allows mathematicians to describe mathematical expressions. So I hope I can quickly Google this. We'll see. Actually, math ML. My mistake. So, not MML. So, here's a simple example. Let me project it real quick. So, what is math ML? Not MML, my mistake. Math ML is where the people that wanted to do math problems said, hey, we're going to create a language to show mathematical stuff. All right? For example, here is a matrix. All right? Uh, boy, I, I seem to recall doing something like this uh, in some kind of math, the, the, the matrix kind of algebra or whatever. But here's what we have. We have math. Okay, you have a matrix. Inside that matrix is a row. And that row consists of several elements. Then we have the next row that consists of several elements. Then we have the next row. So that is a MathML representation of this. Okay? All right. So it's just it's a neat way to represent some data. So... If I wanted to pass, if I was passing mathematical data, let's say I was a scientist and I was passing, I needed to pass a matrix to someone else, and I wanted to do it in electronic form, all right? And I want to make, you know, for, for all the obvious reasons. One way I could do it is I could create a MathML file and then transfer that. And then someone at the other end could take that and have a program that would manipulate that data and do stuff with it, all right? 
So there probably are some other examples here. Here's one. MML for infinity. That's pretty simple. All right. Okay. So, the people that wanted to do math and transmit mathematical expressions electronically took XML and made their own language called MathML that has rules. All right? Like, this is what a matrix, if, if you want to show a matrix, I use a matrix tag. A matrix consists of rows. Each row consists of elements. To tell the people on the other end that, hey, this is MML and not some other flavor of XML, I specify this as my starting and ending tag. Now, what does this look suspiciously like? It looks like HTML, right? Or, more specifically, uh, if you've done XHTML, it looks like XHTML. HTML is sort of a, um, what would you say, it is sort of a stepchild of XML. In other words, it doesn't follow all the rules. It's not a direct descendant of it. But it's sort of in that same family, all right, or cousin, or however you want to put it, all right. Um, XHTML is a child of XML. In other words, it's the rules to define web pages expressed in XML. That's what XHTML is. So, we can, through XML, define the rules to specify any kind of data. All right? As long as we follow the rules of XML. That's a good thing, as Martha Stewart would say. Because if we can store data in a regular, rigid format, then computers can usually do a good job with it, right? If you think of, let's say you call um, um, your credit card company and you want to place a payment, all right? When you have the phone, they'll say, press 1 if you want a, uh, you know, if you want to pay a bill, you press that. Press your account number, press that. Press 1 if you want to pay by check, you press that. What you're doing is they're making you enter the data in in a very regimented, strictly formatted way. You know, if you pick up the, you know, you would like to go and say, hey, I want to make a payment on my bill, take it out of my checking account, boom, and you're done, right? But it doesn't work that way. Why? Because computers don't work so well with freeform data. All right, computers work better when the data is defined very rigidly according to some set of rules. Now, in the world of data like this, those rules are often XML-based. Now, what do we mean by the rules of XML? What makes an XML document a document? Well, first of all, the ML in XML means it's a markup language, which means that it accomplishes its things via tags. All right? And all of us that have done HTML, we know what tags look at like by now. That's a tag. We know that tags come in pairs, starting tag, ending tag. We know that every starting tag has to have an ending tag. We know that tags have to be properly nested. That is that if a tag starts in a tag, it has to end inside that tag. So for example, this CN tag starts inside the matrix row, so it has to end inside the matrix row, and so on down the line. Another rule that you might not have noticed, you might sort of figure out, is that there is only one root node. There's only one root tag for the document. In other words, notice that everything is inside math. The math uh, tag, to use, uh, the, to, to use the, the terminology of trees in XML, doesn't have any siblings. There's nothing on the same level as math. Now, we could say these two matrix rows, or these three matrix rows, are all siblings, right? Because they're all on the same level, all right? And the level is usually represented by indenting, but really what we mean is both of these are included within the matrix tag. So this tag is part of this tag, which is part of this tag. Other thing about um, XML, attribute names. 
in addition to the tag themselves itself, you can have attributes associated with the tags. And you should be familiar with that from HTML. A href equals, all right? What's the href? It's more information. It's not enough to say I have a link. What is a link a link to? So you have to give an href attribute. All right? Same idea here. Okay, math. This is a MathML document. What version of MathML is it? Well, that's what this represents, the version of the MathML. So therefore, if they came up with a better, new, and improved one, then you could tell that it was using that new layout. The rules for an individual language that derives from XML is called a schema. All right? So for example, there's rules that say that a matrix is a valid tag. That's part of the schema for MathML. That a matrix has to have rows. That's part of the schema. And they talk about a document being well formed if it follows all the rules of XML plus it follows the schema of the document that you've defined. All right. Any questions at this point about general XML? And what in the world does that have to do with this class? All right, are we all of a sudden going to be doing integrals and, and uh, that kind of stuff? No. All right. What it has to do with our class is the sitemap is the data for the sitemap of our site is stored in an XML file. All right. For all the reasons that we said before, that's a rigidly defined format, and therefore programs, code, in the .NET framework will have an easy time dealing with it. All right. What do we use the sitemap XML file for? We can use it for the breadcrumbs. What are breadcrumbs again? They're the little links on the top of the page that says, hey, you got here from the home page, went into the networking section, went into the University of Akron section. That's what a breadcrumb is. It shows you the steps of how you got there in the hierarchy of the website. Well, in order to know the hierarchy of a website, it has to be expressed somewhere. All right? These pages that are out on disk just look like they're a bunch of pages, right? How do we know the hierarchy of them? Well, how we can do that is we can do that, and we can specify the logical hierarchy of our site in the sitemap file. So let's go and let's create a sitemap file, and then we'll go and play around with it, and we'll add some things to it, and then we'll see how we use it, all right? One of the key things that XML provides is an incredible amount of flexibility. Again, the idea is, is that you can use XML to represent any sort of data that you want. All right? And part of data, part of representing data is the notion of the, the structure of the data. In other words, we want to be able to show that programming is under the home area, is under the home page and mobile, web, and software are under programming. So that sort of structure or hierarchy is something we can show. And again, you should be familiar with that from HTML because we do that in HTML whenever we nest tags. We're creating a hierarchy to say this link is part of this list, which is part of this navigation section. All right, so let's go up here and say file, new, file. Then we'll select sitemap. And we get this blank XML file. They're sort of nudging us in the right direction, giving us hints of what we want to do. Now, notice a couple things about this. First of all, you might say, hey, you lied about a tag having an ending tag, because this tag doesn't have an ending tag. That's not really a tag. That's what's called a declaration. 
that lets the world know that what character set we're using, we're using a standard character set, and that we're using XML 1.0. Here's the first tag that we have. We have a sitemap, and again, what version of the sitemap we're using, we're using this version of the sitemap. All right. Again, that could help a program later on if there was an enhanced sitemap, that could help the, pro the code differentiate between this style of sitemap and the old version, or, or the, the newer version of the sitemap. So there can only be one sitemap tag, right? Because every XML file can only have one root node. So if I go in and try to put another sitemap tag in here, ooh, I get the red squiggly line. And it tells me, hey, this is invalid because that, it knows that that valid, uh, violates the rules of XML. Doesn't matter what kind of XML document I have, the code in .NET that validates to make sure it's a well-formed XML document knows that that's illegal. It's not just because it's a sitemap document, it's because it's an XML document that can't have two root nodes. What if I want to make up my own tag? Gee, XML is extensible, so can I go in and say my own tag? Nope. Why not? The element sitemap in namespace has an invalid child element, ASD, 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 blah, 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 blah. That's a long sentence to say, hey, in this schema for sitemaps, there's no such thing as this tag. All right. So remember, when you're defining a schema, you can extend XML any way you want to and, and put any features in. But once it's defined, then the programs are going to validate any XML we create using that schema to make sure that it's well formed, that it's valid, that I can't have one of those. All right. Let's go and say, let's put another sitemap node here. Blue squiggly again. Why? Well, the sitemap can only have one sitemap node directly under it. Another way of saying it is there has to be one home page. So you have to define a home page. All right. Now, there can be a bunch of sitemap nodes, sitemap node being, you know, a page on the website, but it all sort of has to stem from a home page. So the schema for this kind of XML file says, hey, inside the sitemap tag, you can only have one child directly underneath the sitemap tag that is a sitemap node. Okay. Now, what we get to do is we get to actually put valid data in after, after showing some of the errors that we, we, we might try to do. All right. So, this first sitemap node is our home page, right? Because it's, it's right underneath the sitemap. So, I will say the URL of it is default dot ASPX. The title is home page. And the description will make home page. I'm probably not going to be very imaginative with some of these descriptions. The title I will try to be accurate on because we're going to we see that um, in our in our uh, breadcrumbs that we put on there. Now if we look back at our tree view, let's say, home is both a page and a grouping for other pages. Just as programming is a page and a grouping for other pages. So, mobile, on the other hand, is a page, but there's no pages underneath mobile. It's not like there's an iPad and an Android page underneath there. 
So sometimes those nodes are called leaf nodes. All right. The leaf node is going to be represented by an empty tag, right? Because there's nothing inside, there's no further branching out from the leaf. So there's nothing underneath the leaf, all right? So we're just going to use an empty tag for that. If something is both a link and a container for other links, then we're going to remove that empty tag and explicitly put the sitemap in sitemap node. Does so everyone know what I mean when I say an empty tag? All right. This is start and end tag rolled up into one. I'm good at doing that. I'm good at asking a question, and if you say you know the answer, I'm giving you the answer anyhow. All right. it, I don't know. It amuses me to do that. All right. So this one, again, following our structure that we have here, we can say, all right, underneath the home page, there is a programming page that has a URL of programming.aspx. There is also a networking. Notice what happens if we try to put that in. Might not give us the error immediately, but at some point the fact that we have two nodes with a URL of the same is going to be disturbing to it. Because it doesn't know where that really sits on the hierarchy. Okay, so programming then has underneath it mobile, web, and software. Networking has associates and Akron. So these are leaf nodes, so I can just represent them by empty tags. my programming page is actually called software now that I think about it. Software and programming. Right. So this should be software. And this guy should be programming. we have the two nodes underneath the networking. We now have the structure of our site encoded in this XML file. All right. This should already be sending bells off or alarms off in your head because this is a good thing, right? 
We're taking a piece of content and we're putting it somewhere else. Right now, the structure of our site is in, well, prior to us making a site map, the structure of our site was in two different places, right? Because I had a menu and I had a tree view. Now, again, I did that just for the purposes of demonstration, but if you think about it, um, there could be occasion, occasion where I would want to represent the site a couple different ways and in different places. Maybe I have a tree view on one page because it makes sense there. Maybe I have a menu on another page. So we have repeated ourselves. We've put the structure of our site both in the menu and in the tree view. And pretty soon, we're going to do the breadcrumbs. That's another place where information about the structure of our site is going to live. All right? So, I'm going to go and I'm going to undo. I'm going to delete the tree view. Delete the menu. And I'm going to recreate it. All right? So, I'm going to go here and... I'm going to recreate a yeah, I'll do a tree view. I guess I could do a menu either. Now, I'm not going to go in and say edit nodes. I'm going to go in and I'm going to say choose a data source. All right. New data source. Now, where is it getting the data from? Is it getting it from our main site map, or is it getting it from some other XML file? Keep in mind, we could use a tree view for a lot of different things, you know, not just for a site map. We could have our own XML file, and we could represent it using a tree view. Well, I want to do it from our site map. All right. So I'll click OK. And now, Lo and behold, our site map, because we put that knowledge into the site map, our tree view reflects that. We don't have to go into find the nodes. This is known as binding. All right. The notion of binding is that we have the notion of binding is that we have in one place that'll refresh at some point. Um, the notion of binding is that in one place we have the data, and in other places we have ways to present that data. And we'll be doing this all over the place when we get to databases, right? Because where's our data going to be? It's not going to be built into our code, into our ASPX pages. It's going to be in our database. Now, that data from the database, we might want to represent a whole bunch of different ways, all right? In which case, we're going to have a source for our data, and then we're going to have some visual presentation of the data. So with Binding in ASP.NET, you have a data source that is bound to some visual component. So that's a nice separation between the data and the visual UI. All right. So now we go and run this, and lo and behold, we get our tree view that is based on... And again, I think I only have some of these pages with content, but if you do notice the address bar, it is going to those pages. All right. And again, this is a little bit problematic. Um, let me, I'll change the style to make the text smaller. Um, or, I don't know, I'll just leave it. It truncates it. You could go, you could go and, and correct that um, if it really bothers you. I don't want to have too perfect of examples because then, you know, you'll just copy them for, for your assignments. All right. <laughs> Um, but again, you see that now I have that site map somewhere. Wherever I need this information about the structure of the site, I can go and I can pop that in. 
So if I wanted to change it to a menu, 